Uh, let me just introduce Ms. Sarnaz Musavi. Ms. Sarnaz Musavi Dillard was born in 1984 in Tehran. She went to elementary school and high school in Tehran. Sarnaz ranked first among tens of thousands of those who took the entrance exam of Azad University. She received her BA in English literature from Azad University of Tehran, Tehran branch. She moved to the United States in 2014 and was admitted to the graduate school at Kenesa University in the American Studies program to study towards an MA in American literature. During her studies, she became more interested in doing research on comparative literature based upon her studies on Persian literature prior to her coming to the US. Sonas had started her studies in Persian literature since she was 13 under the guidance of Professor uh, Omshi. Uh, later on, she had translated some works of literature, mainly on Hafez and Molana. She has done intensive and extensive research on Rumi Hafez and Shabestari. In addition to doing this, she has also done a lot of research on women. Sonas was always involved in art and performance when she was in school. Her extensive readings on philosophy, literature, and art encouraged her to choose art as her career. She started using her paintings as a tool to express her feelings, emotions, and life view. Her paintings have been exhibited internationally, such as Milan and in London. Her works have also been appreciated by local galleries and shows. Sonas established her own company under the name of Asher Art in Asher Art in order to focus on creating art and helping and mentoring other artists. Sarnaz is currently working on her autobiography, a project and a project on Rumi and a children's book. She spends most of her time painting in her home studio and taking care of her five month old uh, baby, Shahan. Okay, Sarnaz Aziz, would you please start? And I also welcome a lot of our American friends who have joined us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. And please do join us you know, for the other programs that we have. We have another program on April 1st that uh, uh, actually uh, an artist, uh, an artist, you know, a painter, famous painter, Iranian American uh, painter is going to actually talk for us and present her paintings. Thank you so much, Sonas, and we are all ears. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight and for being here. And uh, I, first of all, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen with um, Dr. Garmasani to make sure that we got this. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, I'm so glad to be here. And uh, it's really an honor to uh, do this lecture where there are so many successful and educated and lovely ladies here in this group and I really feel honored to um, do this lecture tonight. The topic of the lecture is uh, of course uh, related to the International Women's Day and it's almost a week that we're celebrating. It should be all over the year and all the time and so I'm glad we are here to dedicate some time to this important topic. The topic is reflections on the female Iranian American identity. And um, I, these are uh, solely my reflections. And this is a disclaimer that, one second, sorry. Uh, that these are all my thoughts and opinions and it's not a traditional academic lecture. So if not informative, hopefully you will find it entertaining or relatable. Uh, and always the art of sohbat that I encourage when we um, have our roomy sessions at Kanun, uh, which is actually the art of gathering and talking specifically about love in Sufi tradition. 
So again, I'm honored to be here and thanks again for your all's time. And at some point, at any point of this lecture, again, if you feel um, that you need to leave or this is not uh, you know, really informative, feel free to leave and exit. And I really appreciate your time. So I'm going to do a little introduction about the topic and why I'm going to talk about this. And um, then I will talk a little bit about being an Iranian woman and uh, also becoming an Iranian American woman is going to be the next and also putting it all together. Uh, where do we go from here is also kind of like the conclusion or the ending of this um, presentation, let's say. Since I do art, I also included some of my art between the slides to make it a little bit more entertaining. And also I chose the art that is specifically related to this topic, identity and Iranian American identity. In most of these paintings, I really, uh, especially the ones that I chose in these slides, uh, it really talks about, uh, you know, who I am and uh, it expresses most of my emotions, feelings and desires and everything, uh, which we're going to talk about more. The name of this specific painting is Love or Esh in Farsi and um, is in a private collection. So let's start, as I, uh, Dr. Um, Barzegar uh, mentioned, I'm currently an Iranian American artist. And as described on my website bio, I'm a lover of art, life, and the mysteries of the universe. Come join my artistic journey as I explore themes of mysticism, love, dreams, and philosophy as influenced by great Persian thinkers, such as Rumi, Hafez, Greek philosophers like Socrates, Aristotle, Stoics like Marcus Aurelius, and modern sages like Spinoza, Martin Buber, Meher Baba, Dr. Gomshei, and artists like Mark Chagall, Keihan Kalhor, Yoyoi Kuzama, and Howard Finster. I'm an Iranian American artist, and I'm currently, as Dr. Barzegar mentioned, working on my autobiography and a children's book. I received formal training in watercolors at the age of 16 in my home country of Iran. And I work with acrylics and watercolors to create surreal and abstract forms, landscapes, and Persian calligraphy. I love all forms of art, but some of my favorite styles are Impressionism, Suism, and the Hudson River School of Art, and all spiritual art. I love people. I seek to have awesome interactions with each of which has the potential to become excuse the subject of my... Me, excuse me, Sana, excuse me. Your voice is distorted. I don't know what you've done that your voice is a little bit distorted. Okay. I didn't do anything. I'm sorry if it might be my internet connection. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Is it's it better, better now? now? Okay, okay. Mm. This is another painting, Scream or Faryad, uh, also in a private collection now. And uh, this uh, painting is also very um, expressive and it really uh, is one of my favorite paintings. So the topic says Iranian American identity. First of all, I wanted to talk about this a little bit before we go further. Why Iran Iranian and not Persian? Iranian versus Persian, because we might hear this a lot and um, I will also talk about this in the next slide, that what does it mean when we introduce ourselves as a Persian woman versus an Iranian woman and why I chose the um, uh, term Iranian for this specific lecture. I would say that there is an, um, the Iran Iranica is a great source. If you all want to learn a little bit more about Persian identity versus American identity, what does it mean to be called Persian versus American, uh, sorry, Iranian? And uh, so I definitely uh, recommend taking a look at this amazing source. Lots of great articles has been done. So for this specific lecture, I will stick with Iranian uh, since I believe in the concept of Iran Shah and it also makes sense um, for me here to use um, uh, this term for this specific lecture. This is another painting called Swimming for Integration. And now let's talk a little bit about identity first. What do we mean by identity? Because it's a very broad topic and I wanted to talk a little bit about that first. And as you may all know, so many philosophers during the history have been working on this concept, on this term, and they have tried to define this term. 
Uh, there are two really basic theories on this uh, topic. One of them is the body theory, and one of them is the memory theory. The body theory actually says our identity is our physical self. So my body and you know the physical self equates with my identity. However, the memory theory disagrees with that and it believes that my identity is actually my memories and my thoughts and you know my memories and thoughts make me the person I am. Um, the reason that the, this, um, both of these theories have a little bit of shortcomings is that kind of it's not a stable thing. Like the person you are or who you are can constantly change by these two definitions. If you go by the body theory, uh, you know, your red blood cells keep changing every four months and they're kind of renewed, your skin, uh, you know, the surface skin like kind of sheds and renews every, I don't know, uh, very often. And with the memory theory, if someone loses their memory or they have dementia or some other brain injuries, they totally disconnect with the identity they had and they can't really associate, uh, you know, um, anymore with that identity. So I think one of the uh, definitions that I personally really liked and I thought it kind of uh, bridges between these two definitions and it kind of considers both is actually the definition that was um, uh, suggested by Carla Kaplan. And I'm actually using her article in this book, which is uh, one of the main sources that I use in the American studies. Uh, Keywords for American cultural studies is actually a great source if anyone is interested in uh, learning more about American culture. Uh, I definitely recommend this book. So on page 123, uh, she talks about identity. And I have chosen several lines uh, from this article and I wanted to read it out loud to you just because I wanted to keep it exactly the way she has explained it and I wanted to quote it her exactly. One of our most common terms, identity, is rarely defined. In everyday language, its most common usage, personal identity and social identity, designates meanings not only distinct from one another, but also hierarchically related. Personal identity is often assumed to mediate between social identities and make sense of them. Whereas our social identities shift throughout the day, what allows us to move coherently from one to another is often imagined to be our personal identity or who we are, our constant. Uh, so for example, during the day, I may have many different social like roles, like being a mother, being an artist uh, and et cetera. So it's like my social identity can be kind of fluid and kind of changes during the day, but it's my personal identity or my personality that is kind of the core and kind of keeps me going through these uh, social uh, roles. Hence personal identity conventionally arbitrates taste and lifestyle. It's just not me, a potential home buyer says to her, a uh, realtor. That's so you, a helpful friend, appraises as the shopper steps out of the dressing room. And there is also the dictionary definition. The Oxford English Dictionary uh, dates the origins of this usage to the late 16th century. But this meaning has recently been challenged by social theory and postmodern conceptions of subjectivity and feminist theory has generated specially rich rethinkings of our notion of identity. In, ref in reference to social categories, identity has long carried the meaning of rational and mutable identification actuated either by the individual's uh, chosen identification or by other who label individuals or groups based on characteristics and behaviors that seem shared. So I'm a little doing like, uh, I'm doing a little bit of theory here and I'm not going to do this for all over the lecture. I just wanted to let you know that these theories I'm using here because I wanted to talk about also about my personal experience and my, uh, some of my personal uh, life experiences as a woman. And uh, I'm going to actually apply some of these theories in my speech. So I thought it might be helpful uh, to mention this and it's very short actually. So whereas commonly talk of having a unitarily personal identity, our personality, social identity is regarded as constellation of different and often competing identifications or cultural negotiations. Adrian Rich's volume of poetry, Your Native Land, Your Life, 
is one example of such a negotiation. Drawing on feminism, Jewish history, and progressive social struggles to ask what in identity is chosen and what is given. With whom do you believe your lot is cast? From where does your strength come? There is a whom, where, that is not chosen, that is given and sometimes falsely given. In the beginning, we grasp whatever can, we can to survive. So I think um, Carla Copeland did a great job. Uh, I kind of tried to summarize for me specifically uh, to have like an idea about identity and what do I mean during this uh, talk when I use this term. I also really liked the identity theory or the knowledge theory that was originally coined or generated by Tetens, who was a contemporary of Kant, but 14 years younger than Kant. Uh, but I think he had really great influences on Kant as well. Uh, so he believes that understanding free, uh, feelings and will or beliefs, feelings and emotions and desires are actually three main elements of our consciousness or the person we are, kind of our identity and the core of our identity. And our beliefs and feelings and emotions and desires makes, make us the people who we are. And I think maybe in our roomy sessions too, I have focused on this topic a lot uh, all the way through my life, specifically because, um, because of the role it had in shaping and forming our, our identity. And I'm going to talk about that more in the next slide. This is another painting, Seek Thirst, of Kamju Teshnegiyavarvedas, So another reason that I was drawing on the topic of identity and the definition I shared with you all is because I personally believe that authenticity and integration is an important part of at, le at least my uh, struggle for um, shaping and forming my identity and the person I am today. Um, and I think this has been a struggle specifically as an Iranian uh, woman and as an Iranian American woman, it can be even more complicated. And I'm going to talk about this in a, li a little bit more. So um, some of you, I'm, I'm actually a first generation immigrant. So I'm just maybe, uh, my experience might be more relatable to the women who are also first generation. I'm not sure if the younger, um, you know, females that are here, Iranian, American, if they are any, um, I'm not sure if I can speak for them, but I was born and raised in Iran and I lived there for 30 years. Uh, and um, I believe that the double standards across multiple environments in this society sometimes can create a little bit of tension uh, in terms of, uh, you know, that authenticity and integration that I'm talking about. There are some double standards in terms of in the family, society, school, work, friends, neighbors. I have a great example for this. Uh, when I was um, going to elementary school, for a good elementary school, you had to go through different you know, tests and exams and everything. And I remember uh, my family specifically kept telling me that if they asked me that if you have video player in the house or the VHS, I can say yes, and I should actually hide that information. And if they ask me that information, I should say no. And actually, you know, um, I did that. But that was the first time as a seven-year-old kid, I realized that there is a double standard and I cannot share all the truth or I cannot answer the truth if someone asks me. Um, so I believe that can kind of be true in so many different layers of the society sometimes. And it can make it even more difficult for a woman who is you know, struggling for um, authenticity and integration specifically. There is another um, phrase that sometimes it can be a struggle, which is uh, constantly telling us that you have to conform, that you have to follow the norms and you cannot be extraordinary, you cannot do this and you cannot do that and you always have to follow the rules. And the other thing that I was going to mention here is a, the cultural whiplash that some of you might have also experienced is going from conservative Iran to liberal America and all of the changes that we all might have experienced um, as a result of that. Another example that I had here that I was going to mention, the crow and the scarf, is this story that again, I was for the first year of the elementary school, I was going to this religious school in Tehran 
um, because of, you know, um, everything. And um, I remember that a crow kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> did, uh, pooped on my scarf and I had to take my scarf off. And at the same moment, my principal and the, was in the school bus and they saw me. And the next day they wanted my parents to come to the school and talk to them and ask them that, you know, I, they probably need to change my school because it was so easy for me to take off my scarf in the middle of the street. And I was only seven or eight years old. And that also had a, you know, really big influence on my identity and how I had to handle everyday life in that country. And I'm sure that, you know, here coming here, you might all have had the experience of wearing no scarf or not having that concern, at least when you want to go out of the door. For me, it was always a concern. Sometimes you have nightmares that, oh, if I forget my scarf, da, da, da. And also, as uh, someone who had an early marriage in Iran, unfortunately, and had to go through a very difficult process of divorce and all the little dirty secrets and all the different difficult, you know, steps that you have to take as a woman in order to gain your freedom and, um, you know, establish the life that you desire and you wish for. Another painting is this one is called Ear Mouth or Noosh Goosh, also uh, based on another poem by Rumi. So what does it mean to be an Iranian or if you want to call it Persian woman? <clears throat> As uh, Dr. Varzagar mentioned, uh, I've always been interested in literature and I'm sure there are so many of you all sophisticated, educated Persian women or Iranian women who also had the same uh, interest because it's kind of in our culture, it's in our, um, you know, by birth, it seems like you have this love and this uh, passion for literature. And it's really important in our country, uh, poetry and literature, prose, any kind of that. Uh, in some other countries like in Greek or in England, it might be plays or dramas and uh, some other countries philosophy. But for us, it's always been poetry and literature and all the beauties of it. So there's always, you know, that aspect of being a Persian woman um, and the poeticness and the romantic uh, side of it and all of those uh, beautiful things that comes with this um, identity. Also, um, it's important to see how women were depicted, uh, you know, through social media or uh, mass media and all of that in pop culture, the Persian woman, which I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, if they are sometimes shown as lovers, seductresses, things of beauty, which can actually really, it has been a big stop or a barrier for so many of successful Persian women um, who really had to go beyond that and really cared way more than that. And they never wanted to be, you know, um, just seen as a beautiful thing or as, as a thing of beauty or a seductress or lover. And I think um, this concept has always also been a challenge for so many of, you know, Persian women. Evil and conniving, especially like we see in the uh, poetry of Shakespeare sometimes, you know, the darker woman, the dark eyed woman is always associated with this, um, um, you know, uh, adjectives. And of course, other stereotypes, negative versus positive versus neutral that I'm sure you might have all heard of it. Again, I was born and raised in Tehran and uh, in 1984 till 2014 when I moved here, um, I was doing good in the school. And of course I was really influenced by my female teachers. Uh, one of my great friends from uh, middle school, high school is here, Shima Ta'alohi Moin, uh, Dr. Moin. And I'm really thankful uh, for her for being here. And I'm sure so many of my experiences might be really relatable and she might find them interesting. Uh, but um, <clears throat> she might also remember that so many of us, because of the limitations and because of the pressure or anything that, you know, uh, that will limit us to that specific um, environment of the classroom, there was so much attention on the teacher and on the female teachers we had. And we would really uh, you know, look at them as role models. And sometimes we would get disappointed. Sometimes we would be really happy with that uh, you know, ideal um, figure. Also, my family, I was, uh, you know, in a traditional family. I was the only kid. My mother and my father definitely had a huge role in shaping my identity in many different ways. 
And of course, my grandparents, especially my maternal grandma, had a huge role in shaping my identity. And I'm sure so many of you might have the same experience. Um, and uh, it was uh, true for me. This painting is hair down. This is also one of the works that I've done, uh, um, which is really uh, talking about the subconscious and also um, the integrity that I was talking about, the five divisions of the consciousness and um, three divisions and the uh, behavior and the speech, which are the other two divisions. I also tried to show in the different colors of this painting of the hair of this painting. So going back again, an Iranian woman, uh, I personally sh am sharing some of my experience tonight. I'm not going to share too much and I'm not going to uh, make you bored or tired or anything. And I'm actually trying to work on my autobiography. I've been trying writing it for two years now. Uh, it's been very difficult and it's been a challenge and uh, I hope I can share it with you all when it's done. Uh, but. Uh, the big part of my life uh, as a teenager, when I was 17 years old, I was, um, you know, kind of, um, I had to be in an early marriage, an arranged marriage, which was really um, traumatic for me. And it was a big, um, I would say pushback and I couldn't really reach my goals or get where I wanted to get. And it was a big shock for me. I also experienced toxic femininity uh, within that, um, within the dynamics of that early marriage. And, you know, as um, some of us uh, might know that there are so many women in that country that might go through the same experience, but it was kind of very uh, unusual for my generation, for the social class and the environment I was living in specifically. Um, and it was very unfortunate for me and it definitely left an imprint on me and had to, uh, it definitely had motivated me to work way harder in life to reach my goals. Another thing that also came with this early marriage was the idea that how invisible sometimes a young female can be um, in, in our society, in our country of Iran, uh, with everything that is going on, it's really hard uh, and it's really easy to get lost and to be invisible. And um, it's so unfortunate. And one of the reasons that I'm, I was really excited about doing this lecture tonight, I was hoping that especially women in this group um, you know, can help each other to and lift each other up and help each other even more than, you know, I'm sure you all do. Uh, but uh, we usually never know what's really going on in someone else's life or in, you know, a young girl's life uh, until we ask or until we care. And I think it's really important to be that helping hand if we can, because it could really change uh, my personal life. Then I, uh, spent so much time, as you may all know, I have a 20 year old son and uh, I spent, uh, you know, uh, the first 10 years as a single mom. And uh, it was very, sorry, after 10 years, I started being a single mom and raising my son by myself. And it was very difficult to be a young mother in Iran. I was kind of standing out in that community already for being a young mom. And uh, being a young mom and a single mom specifically was very difficult as we know that the job market for a woman who also had to, you know, postpone her um, college education and everything like that and has no support, it's been very difficult. And um, it was just, you know, um, a matter of surviving and just um, hoping that you can reach where you want to reach. And also, you know, dealing with running the household and everything, I was uh, totally independent and uh, all by myself. Meanwhile, uh, since I've always been interested in uh, English and Persian literature specifically, uh, studying Sufism became very um, uh, important to me and it was very inspirational and motivational for me. And it really helped me to get through that difficult times and to uh, give meaning to the sufferings or to everything else that I was going through. And my views and um, understanding of the Sufism have constantly changed over time as I have been, you know, studying it. As Dr. Varazegar mentioned, going to college and um, English literature specifically was a field that uh, is not um, necessarily a great market for specifically women, I should say. So that was also a struggle and uh, all the loops that you have to go through uh, in order to find a job after that and uh, to 
find your position or your place in the society. And that's what I did. And it was very difficult to do that in Iran. And uh, I was doing, I was teaching English language classes, comparative literature, translation works and everything to, you know, uh, go through, to go through life and raise my son. And uh, after that, I started getting prepared to move to the States in 2014. And um, let's go to the next slide. This one, this painting is called Dream Walk. Uh, this is also in a pair of private collection with watercolor. I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, the be, becoming an American or Iranian American woman. Uh, this process of becoming, I mean, this uh, phrase becoming is actually really important and it's really a process. And um, I'm sure again, so many of you first generation ladies might have also uh, shared the same experience. There was also a book which is called Becoming Americans. Um, this book also have helped me a lot in understanding, you know, this process. It's full of diaries and articles by different immigrants who have become really successful and well known now. But it's, um, you know, really kind of like real short stories that I really recommend if you're interested in knowing more about identity and becoming an American it really helps. Uh, here in America, I was really dealing with so many different problems than I was dealing with in Iran, again, as a single woman, single mother. Of course, the immigrant LinkedIn uh, wishes all your friends and the, you know, other people who have gone through this process was always helpful. And there were so many ladies here that were also very understanding of where I'm coming from and what I'm going through. And they also were uh, really helpful. And I had this opportunity even more uh, when I moved to America, way more than Iran. Uh, and as Dr. Varzegar uh, again mentioned, uh, American studies was a great experience, but definitely not my ideal major. And after, uh, during this time, I was also uh, um, going up the corporate ladder. I worked for a healthcare system for a very short time as a contract manager and um, Kaiser Permanente. And also I was um, you know, the head of a luxury retail and fashion and all of that just to, you know, uh, pay the bills and everything because with literature and with American studies and everything, you really can't do that being a single mom. And that was also um, really hard, you know, coming from a country that you already are dealing with double standards and then trying to deal with this new identity that you are trying to create and build. And, um, you know, at the same time doing things that it's not necessarily your passion, working in a corporate system or, uh, you know, fashion or retail was definitely not something I wanted and it was definitely soul sucking for me. And it's so unfortunate that so many women, if they have a kid or if they are responsible, have to sometimes prioritize them over their own success sometimes. And of course, dating experience that I was um, going to talk, uh, was, uh, talk about was totally different. Dating an um, American, man for me and getting married to an American uh, uh, guy was definitely a different experience for me than uh, my previous experience. And that also shaped and formed me a lot. And I learned a lot during that process. And I think it also changed my identity, not changed, but you know, shaped and formed my identity. And of course the US citizenship, which I think so many of you might have gone through that process. Uh, you know, you know, you have a green card, you come here with visa or whatever, but that moment of the, um, when you become a citizen, it's a very emotional, it's a very intense moment. And I believe for some reason, um, it definitely uh, has an impact on shaping the identity. And in 2020, I was able to establish Asher Art, my company, and, uh, you know, dedicate my time full time to art and, you uh, you know, uh, research and the projects that I've always been trying to do and they have always been delayed because of, you know, um, issues and difficulties of life. And uh, it was in October that I became a mother again after 20 years. And so I have two sons, um, 20 years gap right there. And this is another painting by me, Dream, uh, Dreamland One. Uh, this is also watercolor on paper.
So in this slide, I just wanted to, based on everything that I said, I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the differences and what's the difference between being an Iranian woman and an Iranian American woman. So there are, this is a little bit complicated and we can talk about this a lot and a lot. And I'm sure I, I really am looking forward to hear your views and ideas on this as well. But one of the things that I experienced and it might be relatable is the denial of the new identity and fear of losing the old culture. It can be really strong specifically for me because I was really rooted in that culture, the literature, the poetry and everything. And I felt really a huge void uh, when I moved to the States till I find, found my family and uh, friends in literature and all of you all. And, uh, but I think it's uh, something that was definitely uh, difficult. And, it, and, and I started to learn and realize that um, learning more about the American identity or becoming American does not necessarily mean that I have to deny my culture or I have to deny my cultural identity. And, but this is just something easy to be said and to be done. And of course, uh, does one lose anything by coming to America? Of course, it's the loss of the community and the uneven diaspora ways, especially in Atlanta and Georgia, it was really difficult for me uh, being a part of uh, big spiritual groups or literary groups and, uh, you know, having those groups and friends, it was very difficult for me to be here and uh, not to have those kinds of connections. And it also feels like you're losing your identity. All the things that were important to you and were making you the person you were are kind of uh, changing and shifting all the time. Well, I definitely uh, miss family, friends, traditions, food, culture, and all of that. And uh, I think that uh, most of us can always you know, hold a place for that in our lives. And we always try to make time and we try to find friends, Persian friends, or um, you know, the food and culture, we try to keep it alive by all of these meetings and everything. But again, it's been a struggle for me. Being a native, not an immigrant, is something that you might deal with uh, on a daily basis. And uh, for women, it might be even stronger uh, for uh, the reason that even most American women struggle with the notion of power in white male supremacist society, let alone, you know, an immigrant woman. She can also, you know, go through the same issues and it can be even more difficult for a Persian or Iranian woman. Another painting, which was, um, it's also watercolor and it's a private, in a private collection and it was inspired by Pocahontas and I called it my Pocahontas. So talking about all those differences and going back to where we started in the beginning of the lecture, uh, the idea of Iranian versus Persian and all the stereotypes that are, uh, you know, associated with these two terms. Is, is, is a huge deal, especially in shaping, you know, a female identity. Uh, we might have all these different stereotypes that we, you might have seen, especially my American friends, if you are here, uh, the way that the media uh, tries to represent, especially the Persian or the Iranian woman, as I mentioned, is always the thing of beauty. And, uh, you know, uh, while our culture really tries to introduce people like Maryam Mizahani or other, you know, important um, scientific, you know, faces or mathematicians and Nobel Prize winners and all of that. But you see that the social media or the mass media or the pop culture usually introduces the Persian or the Iranian woman really differently, either in a, you know, covered or um, if it's in shots of sunset, you see all those, late, you know, female characters in that show. Or, you know, um, sometimes they overdo it as try to portray them, uh, you know, as solely being academic or the concept of martyrdom is also something that is, in, is a stereotype, especially for the Iranian mother, for the woman that, uh, you know, they portray this woman as a martyr who has no other life and has been, uh, you know, sacrificing everything. And this is also an image that is also really popular. Sorry. And the, also the image of the ideal woman. And this is also very cultural and um, you know that like a Renaissance man, there is this ideal woman in our culture that everyone is seeking and there are specific you know, attributions and 
um, which is sometimes really annoying. And um, again, it can always be a matter of beauty and doing this and doing that. And, um, it definitely is sometimes, you know, not what you really want to be recognized with. And also, you know, the sexual stereotypes like Kim Kardashian, some people think, oh, she's Persian or Armenian or, you know, uh, the fact that, oh, she's chosen, she doesn't choose, uh, like lack of agency in this character. These are really struggles that I personally, you know, when you see someone, they, they have the prejudice. And when they uh, meet you for the first time, uh, you feel that some of these stereotypes are out there, you know, even... Uh, if you want to change it, it takes a lot of time to change that person's mind. So again, while every woman has lots of struggles in this white supremacist society, I think Persian women, minorities, minority women have even more difficult job to do specifically when these stereotypes are out there for them. Doesn't make it easy. This painting is called Mother Teresa. And I know I talked a lot and I'm sorry, I'm finishing almost. And uh, in the end of this lecture, uh, first of all, I wanted to mention my amazing friend here. Uh, again, Shimat Moin. Uh, she's been a great role model for me. She's been a great friend for me, a very successful scientist and researcher. And I'm so proud of her. Uh, there have been so many of you in this group that I look at you know, as role models and I really appreciate everything that I have learned from all these great women in this group. Each of them uh, needs to be celebrated here. And my mom, my family, my friends who had a you know, role in shaping me and my identity. But I had a list of people that I just wanted to you know, uh, share with you that as a female really um, shaped and formed my identity and the person I am. There are two or three guys in the list like Sohrab Setehri or Spinoza um, or uh, uh, I believe, there were one or two uh, guys in the list too, but Simone Dubois, uh, the French philosopher, Simine Behbahani, Iranian poet, Simon Whale, a French philosopher, Kathleen Rain, British poet, Lala Ashwari or Lala Kashmiri, she's a mystic poet, um, Iran Daroudi, an Iranian artist, which uh, we lost her unfortunately, recently, Parvine Tesami, uh, Furugh Farrokhzad, an Iranian poet again. Uh, I mentioned Sohrab Sepehri, Dr. Omshe, Spinoza, again, a guy. Uh, but they really helped me form a really uh, beautiful or helpful theories of um, womanhood as a, you know, um, I learned their philosophy. Marzia, of course, a Persian singer who always stands as a, you know, um, stands out for me as a Persian singer, as a Persian woman. Delkash, again, another Persian singer. I had a teacher named uh, Miss Musavi. She was actually uh, same last name in uh, middle school. She had a huge impact on me to follow literature and my writings and everything. Uh, I had a professor named uh, Lady Iranpur. Uh, she was also very encouraging and a great model for me. Bell Hooks, uh, American thinker and author. I really appreciate everything I learned from her. Um, Miss Kahnamui, who was also a childhood teacher and she really challenged my ideas about feminism and um, the Islamic representations of a woman and it was uh, my ideas were really challenged by her and I really appreciate it and Rabai al Basrek, uh, who was also a poet a mystic poet and Emily Dickinson an American poet and I tried to put some of uh, the paintings of this uh, amazing women that kind of had a uh, big impact on me and my identity. If you want to stay connected with me, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on, I'm on YouTube, and you can also email me everywhere. It's Asha Art. If you search Asha Art, it should you know, be consistent. And I really appreciate your time and thank you so much for listening. And um, I'm looking forward to talking to you all a little bit. And if there are any, um, questions i would appreciate it and i would like to talk and khoda hafiz in farsi means goodbye <laughs>